So every one of us to be born into a culture have been wounded by that culture to some degree. That, that we have to work through our socio-cultural history in order to find our true self. And the wonder child is your true self. So, so what we're looking at here is who, who was this, who is this reality, what is this reality in me that I had to give up when I adapted to survive, when I had to uh, not show my fear, when I had to pretend like I wasn't afraid or not, not be angry or when my sadness was shamed. Uh, that, that was the part of me that I want to reconnect with. Alice Miller called it that nearly autistic child. And she said, I'm going to let that child lead me. Because there is something about, there's something about the spontaneity of the child that the child is connected, born, comrade, a bird, beast, and tree. Children, in a sense, are natural mystics, but they're not reflexive mystics. In one sense, we are all born at one with all things, we have to develop a kind of an ego boundary in order to get it that we're one with all things. And ultimately, we have to give up that boundary, at least in un to understand that that boundary is a socio-cultural boundary. It's something that's been created out of a culture. And so the, the, the wonder child is our authentic self. It's the self that is, that is the deepest, realest part of me. It is my true self. And uh, what we want to look at is uh, how, do we, how do we get to this self? How do we find this self? Everything that I've been talking about is a way to get to this self, to do the reclaiming work, to do the championing work. Now, we've got to realize that, that the wonder child is spontaneous, the wonder child is creative, the wonder child is resilient. Uh, the wonder child is all of those things that I described earlier on in the program where I was describing the wonderful child. What I want to suggest to you tonight, the, these are eight astounding propositions that I'm going to make, and I've actually adapted these from uh, 14 propositions that I read one time that Willis Harmon had assembled. He's a guy that is a transpersonal psychologist. And he works with the, literally the extent of our power. What is the extent of our power? You see, as a wounded inner child, codependent, shame-based person, I lived my life defensively. I lived my life just basically surviving. And I, I promised you at the beginning uh, of, of this series that I was going to talk about a journey to wholeness, that is, moving toward finding <clears throat> our power, our personal power. Because what life is about is having personal power. The problem of childhood is that for the first six years, we're powerless. So that what happens to us there, we're dependent on whoever it is that happen to be our caretakers. And uh, what happens in those first six or seven years, as we have seen, has a drastic effect on our lives. Now, it has a drastic effect, but it's not an effect that we can't do something about. Uh, it, it, we can find our true self, but we've got to be willing. There's an, old, there's an old saying in therapy, it'll work if you will work. It will work if you will work. If you're willing to make the commitment, if you're willing to do the championing, uh, it's possible for all of us then to find this true self, this true and authentic self. Now, in these propositions, the first, the first premise is that each of us has access to a supraconscious mind. Now, supraconscious, higher conscious, larger conscious, cosmic conscious, you can call this whatever you want. But <clears throat> the data that we have from dreams, for example, uh, the data that is coming in from the studies that J.B. Ryan did at Duke <clears throat> on extrasensory perception, on telepathy, on telepathy in dreams. Uh, in 1958, he presented findings to the American Psychological Association that were incontrovertible, that what he had found was unequivocally beyond any kind of possibility of chance. 
And what he basically said was that we have a consciousness that's beyond our ordinary consciousness. That our ordinary consciousness is characterized, especially if you're a wounded child person, if you're an adult child person, by the wounds. See, see, if there was a hole in the roof tonight, I'd become roof conscious. I would become roof conscious. I would go where, where the danger was. Uh, adult children, people with wounded inner child, are often very childish and, and often very egocentric. Why? Why, w- why would we be so egocentric? Because if you have a chronic toothache, all you can think about is your tooth. And so if you have a hole inside of you, if you feel like there's an emptiness or an absence, so much of my life I never felt like I belonged. I felt like I was kind of standing on the sidelines watching life go by. And so when you you live like that with that hole inside of you, that sense of absence, Marion Woodman tells the story of a woman in Toronto who went to, to see the Pope. Uh, and she wanted to get some pictures of the Pope, so she set up her tripods and all this stuff. And she, she, she was so busy, she got the picture, but she didn't see the Pope. So later on, when she developed the picture, the man she came to see was in the picture, but she was absent from the experience. Now, that, that, that's a fantastic description of the wounded inner child or a toxically shamed human being who is split inside, that that we're in our life, but we're not in our life. I used to say I had this exciting first 30 years. I just wasn't in on it. Uh, uh, Our people ask me a lot, you know, in interviews, have you ever had an out-of-body experience? And, you know, my answer is I've hardly ever been in my body. Uh, So I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. So... Uh, this idea that when, when you live in that kind of egocentric defensiveness, there's no way that you could get to any kind of higher consciousness. There's no way. So, so it's, it's, it's so important that we get it, that we have this higher consciousness, that we have higher kinds of possibilities, uh, that we really can do things that we didn't know we could do. And, and, you know, we're getting evidence now, uh, I think, of uh, Ambrose and Og- Olga Warrell. Some of you may have heard of Olga Warrell and Ambrose Warrell, but they were psychics, and uh, they, were, they, were, they were some of the most humble people that perhaps we've ever had who had these kind of extraordinary powers. Uh, Olga Warrell was brought into Menninger's over and over again to diagnose cases that, that had befuddled the doctors because she was clairvoyant, which meant she could see things that were not apparent to other people. And uh, Elmer and Alice Green at the Menninger Clinic studied them, as they did Jack Swartz in Oregon. Jack Swartz is a psychic in Oregon. Now, a lot of people get real scared about psychics, and I hear this fanatical New Age sort of uh, phrase that means, I don't know what exactly it means, but... For some people, it means something terrible. And I don't even know what they're talking about when they use it. Uh, but, but what I'm talking about is not new age. It's something that's, whatever that means, it's something that's grounded in some pretty sound psychological research. Uh, Elmer and Alice Green are pretty sophisticated scientists at the Menninger Clinic, and they studied Jack Swartz. In fact, they did a, a film called The Yoga of East and West, where they went and they, they videotaped some of the yogis and some of these people who have voluntary controls over involuntary processes. And Jack Swartz has that kind of ability. Uh, I have seen movies of him taking an 18-inch knitting needle and sticking it through veins with an electroencephalogram showing that his consciousness stays in alpha brainwave patterns the whole time And then when he pulls it out, he heals it. He heals the wound himself. And uh, Jack's been doing this for years. He's a personal friend of mine. Uh, I've been to his workshops and seminars. He's he's eaten three meals a week for the last 32 years. 
he, he's figured out a way to photosynthesize energy without going through the middleman like lettuce and vegetables. He sleeps two hours a night. This guy's the answer to the hunger problem in the world. Uh, we ought to be studying him on the evening news. Uh, uh, Jack's written books on voluntary controls. Uh, he teaches at Grants Pass in Oregon. Uh, I, I, it astonishes me that there's not more study of a man like this, that people are not more interested, you see, because one of the, one of the problems is, is that we get habituated in a belief system. The sociologists of knowledge tell us that we create culture, and then culture creates us. It tells us what we can believe and what we can't believe. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw that program, That's Incredible. There was a guy on there who would catch arrows. It was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. You know, this guy would go, boom, the guy would go, boom, catch the arrow right out of the middle of the air. And, and what always fascinated me about that is, who ever thought you could catch an arrow? See, see, all of a sudden, one day, this guy must have been sitting there thinking, I wonder if you can catch an arrow. Uh, and, 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 and what he did is he started working on catching arrows. See, in other words, he challenged the existing belief system. He said, wait a minute. How do you know you can't catch an arrow? And there was another guy on there that jumped over cars that were coming 50 miles an hour down the highway. Uh, you know, how did this guy ever think of that? I wonder if you can jump over a car, you know? It's like, where does this come from, this kind of incredible uh, ability? It's changing belief systems. <clears throat> so what I want to suggest to you, and especially those of you like me that have lived your life so much on the outside, like codependence, we've been other-aided, believing that all happiness <clears throat> was on the outside, or we've been so scared that we were always adapting and defending, or we were so shame-based, like me, that, I, that I've guarded lest I ever be unguarded, so my energy is all out here. You know, I used to have a professor in Toronto who said, choose your enemies well, because your enemies condition you. Like, like if I think your enemies, I'm going to be thinking about you, and I'm going to be, you know, creating my thought patterns around my enemy. If you think everybody's the enemy, if you're scared of everything, then that's going to highly condition the way we think. <clears throat> so as I own this child in me, and let him know it's safe. I'm going to be his champion. I'm going to be his champion, and it's safe to be here, and we're going to have our feelings, and we're going to have our needs, and we're going to have our wants as, as, as much as we possibly can. We're going to have them within the context of our life without hurting anyone else. We're going to have them. And I'm going to operate on the belief that I do have this higher consciousness, this larger consciousness. And that this consciousness is connected to all other forms of consciousness. Now, what that is the work that's being done at Stanford Research Institute right now. Uh, Putoff and Targ, who are physicists, wrote a book called Mind Reach. They also wrote a book, well, Russell Targ did, called Mind Race, where he's describing the Russians and how the Russians are doing all of this work on higher consciousness doing a lot of work on what's called remote viewing perception, sensory perception, remote viewing, where somebody sits in a room and someone else goes to an appointed target area, somebody who doesn't know where they're going ahead of time, and starts taking Polaroid pictures. And at precisely the moment they hit the target area, the person in the room starts saying what he or she sees are drawing pictures that they see, or recording on a tape recorder what they see. And uh, they have had incredible kinds of data come out of that, that people can do this, that we are not limited by time and space in ways that we have believed we are. Where a whole culture believes it is limited by time and space, then that's the way we operate, limited by time and space. What this kind of work is suggesting, and I, I by no means am telling you that it's all proven, is that we have a larger consciousness, that there is evidence. Hela Hamud was one of the people they used who could not only remote view in, in space, she could remote view in time. 
she could start writing and drawing what they were going to see before they left. And she was, she was a photographer, and, and this is all written up. It's written up in a book called The Silent Pulse by George Leonard. It's written up in a book called Mind Race by Russell Targ. Uh, I, I'm not trying to present this as data, but what I'm trying to present is that there's, there's some possibilities that when you've lived in defensive structures all your life that you've never even considered, that we resist this knowledge. We resist it because of our wounds. We also resist it because of language. See, language cuts the world up. We murder to dissect, Wordsworth said. When, when, when you define something, you put limits on it. There, there are great, there are great art, artist teachers who don't want their students to have had any formal education because formal education puts you in all these categories and you start cutting the world up into all these categories. You see, a little child doesn't have all those categories. A little child has this immediate connection with the world and all the things in the world. Uh, listen to Frances Wicks. She's a Jungian analyst. She says, experiences of timeless realities may come to the very young child. As he grows older, problems press upon him. His ego must grow to meet the demands of greater consciousness. And numinous experiences may appear to be forgotten by the ego, but remembered by the higher self. Now, and a little bit later in the program, I'm going to do a meditation with you and talk about some of the ways that we could connect. It, suppose that was possible. Suppose it was possible that your child, your wonder child, really knew a lot of stuff, that you know a lot more than you know you know, uh, that, that, that right now in your unconscious, there's a lot of stuff you know that you didn't know you knew. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you've done in your life that you didn't know you could do. There's a lot of things that you got through that you didn't know you would ever be able to get through. And, and you're not thinking of those things right now. You're not thinking of those things because you see the sort of consciousness is focused. That's why the Buddhists talk about ignore ants. You see that, that when I'm looking over here, I'm not looking over here. It, it's, it's why the Buddhists say that if you're in human form, there's always going to be suffering. Why? Because you don't have this full knowledge that you could have. So, so let's, let's say we resist this knowledge. Culture. Culture tells you how to be a man, how to be a woman. It tells us how the world is. Oh, that's a, you know, I, I, I've given lectures on this. Oh, people say, oh, that's a bunch of hogwash. And yet we've got data on it. Um, Ken Pelletier right here in San Francisco at the Langley Porter Neuropsychiatric Clinic has done all kind of stuff on the on the powers of mind. Uh, so, so all I'm suggesting to you is that we do resist this knowledge, and the more that you're willing, the more you feel safe in your life, the more that little child in you feels safe, the more you'll begin to, begin to come out. You'll begin to let yourself have this part of you, which I'm calling your wonder child this part of you that, that no one's ever been like this before. There's never been anybody like you, and there never will be anybody like you again. That, that all consciousness is purposeful. Now, let me go back to this point just for one second. The idea of that extrasensory kind of knowing is that we're really not limited, that we really are all connected in consciousness. That's why you can be telepathic. That, that's why you can be clairaudient or clairvoyant. My mother was, I know. Uh, didn't, what, didn't, wasn't your mother clairaudient or clairvoyant? She knew. She knew every time I was drunk. She knew every time I was drinking. It, it was awesome. And, and, you know, as people hear this kind of material, they come forth and they say, yeah, you know, I knew right when my uh, son was having the accident or I knew right when my cousin was dying uh, I, I knew things that, that I could not have known by ordinary consciousness. Consciousness is purposeful. Now, now one thing I, I, I want to jump here for a second to seven. Mind and matter are both energy. That's what Einstein taught us. So what does that mean? It means that body and mind, it means that consciousness is energy and that when we look at consciousness, it's purposeful. I mean, you don't just go around in circles all day long. You go in some direction. Consciousness is intentional. So 
It's possible for us to think that this higher kind of consciousness has a plan for us. That, that is, that there's a direction that, that we were uniquely uh, born to, to go for. That is, that we were really moving in that direction. I, I knew at 10 years old, standing on Fannin Street, Fairview Street in Houston, Texas, some of the things that have happened in my life. Now, it's kind of eerie to say that. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people get real frightened when they hear this kind of stuff. But, but it's all come true. And I trust that. I trust that deep, deep part of me. That, that's what I called earlier your soul. That, that what cries out in abuse. Something that moves you to recovery. See, it couldn't be your wounded self that moved you to recovery. How could your wounded self move you to recovery? Uh, Francis of Assisi say, said once, who we are looking for is who is looking. Who we are looking for is who is looking. This witnessing self. So it's possible that there's a plan for us. I know that I was supposed to do what I'm doing. I know it. Uh, and, and a little bit later, I'm going to talk about a couple of serendipities. These, you know, these, these synchronicities that suddenly something happens. And you don't, I mean, it seems like chance, and, and maybe it is chance. But it, but it gets kind of eerie after a while. And a lot of people in 12-step programs talk about this all the time. Uh, you know, it's kind of eerie. The, the resources are available, mind over matter. See, ma mind over matter, that, that I can open myself to this consciousness. In, in the 12-step programs, they talk about a higher power. Well, what is this if it isn't a higher power? Now, whatever you want to call that, you can call this supraconscious mind God and say we're part of that, or you cannot call it that. You can just say we have that. And that the only obstacle to all of this is our lack of belief. And that if we would operate in accordance with that higher consciousness, we would connect. We would connect. We would really connect with each other. In fact, that's one of the things that I see happening in this inner child work. As people sit around, and tell their stories. As you've watched in some of these video segments and past programs, the kind of bonding that takes place. See, see that lonely little child in me, when I sit and I hear about one of you who came out of an alcoholic home, or I hear one of you who came out of a workaholic home, or a violent family, or I hear one of you talking about your sexual abuse, uh, and I hear the loneliness in that little child in you, and, and the, the loneliness in my little child connects with that. And, and then we, we all bond together, and there's kind of a way that, that the wonder child connects with each other when we tell our stories to each other. So one of the ways that we can find that wonder child is by being willing to tell our stories. There's something about telling stories that is very, very powerful when you hear someone else's story. And for a long time in my life, I could cry about your story, but I couldn't cry about mine. You know, I, I, but, but, it, but it was okay because other people's stories helped me to begin to own and embrace my own story. So uh, these are the propositions that, that there is this wonder child in us and that there are ways to connect with this wonder child, which is this higher kind of consciousness. And here are some of the kinds of things that, that I talk about, uh, what, what I call energetic emergences, or what Carl Jung called energetic emergences. Uh, telling our stories is one of the ways to connect with the wonder child. That is, you connect with that authentic little person, and it's okay to come out of hiding because you're telling me about your pain. It's okay for me to come out of hiding because you're telling me about what happened to you. See, one of the things I know is that when people are willing to stay in their pain, when people are willing to be rigorously honest, when we're willing to be vulnerable, uh, one of the things we're working on in our, uh, in our treatment center is being in our healthy shame. Because you cannot do this work if it isn't safe. And we found that therapists shame people in very, very unusual ways that, you know, if I'm overly attached to my own theories, 
Like, like if I believe that everything's about an Oedipal complex, I'll start asking you the kind of questions, and before I'm through, I'll get an Oedipal complex out of you. And, and if you're a good, shame-based person, and I'm not getting the Oedipal complex I want, you'll pick up that I'm disappointed. And, and you'll feel shamed that you're not getting this right as a patient. Uh, I went to a psychiatrist one time, and I became the kind of person he needed to feel good about himself as a psychiatrist. Uh, because as a good shame-based person, I could pick up the micro-calibrations in his face. And he was a very rigid therapist. He had a very clear idea. And I, I don't mind somebody being that if they tell me ahead of time, here's my model, here's what I use, but, but you know, don't lay it on me. Uh, persistent childhood memories. Persistent childhood memories. Carl Jung uh, talked about place in his memoirs where he was stuck. He was stuck in his thinking. In fact, he was very disturbed. And he went to his own, he went to his own therapist. And uh, he got in touch with a memory when he was 10 or 11 years old, where he had been playing with, with blocks and mud and bottles and building castles. And his remark in his memoirs was, there's some kind of energy left in this memory because I went right to it. I'm going to do a meditation with you in a little bit about this. Finding a memory that may still have energy. He went to this, and what he did is for several months, every day at noon, he started playing with mud and blocks and bottles and buildings. And uh, he would play with them in the evening. You know, folks were probably pretty alarmed by this. Uh, but uh, he, he said, I have to do this. I have to do this. There's something in my little boy, and here's, I, this is what I call the wonder child. There's something in my wonder child that, that's trying to get my attention about this. There's something I need to finish here, something I need to connect with here, some kind of energy. And as he tells it in, in his autobiography, uh, after he finished, at a certain point, the energy was gone for these building blocks. And uh, it was very shortly after that he came up with the theory of the collective unconscious. It like it opened up. It opened up that consciousness. And it was incredible because I had had an incident in my childhood where I was building a, a balsa wood model plane, as some of you may remember, where they have all those little parts. They still have them. And uh, uh, my brother accidentally crushed it. I had it all done, but I hadn't had the paper. I hadn't put the paper on it yet. My brother crushed it. And I never went back to it. And I, I never remembered this until I read this in Carl Jung, but at about 39 years old, I decided I am going back to build a model airplane, but I'm going to put the paper on it this time, and I'm going to paint it. And I worked till like 3 in the morning every night building this balsa wood model plane. I put the paper, I painted it yellow. Uh, I, I, I don't think I've ever been so excited about anything. And then I finished it. And, and this would be about 11 years ago. And, and again, I never connected with any of this till I read this piece in Jung that suddenly I had this wave of creativity in my life. You know, the last 11 years have been unprecedented in my life in terms of creativity. Now, I think there was some energy there. And this is what I mean by a persistent childhood memory. There's something unfinished. And that wonder child wants to expand and expand and expand, but it's blocked. Sometimes it'll come out in dreams. I had a client that was a very, very successful lawyer in a great big law firm, uh, but he, and he was very stoic. He was very unfeeling. He had this dream, and he just started sobbing, and he sobbed for about four days. And the dream was about an animal hospital. And what he got in touch with is as a child, he wanted to be a veterinarian. And his father used to ridicule him for this, you know, tell him that that's stupid and that's a dumb kind of profession. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the whole story. The outcome of the story was the guy quit the law firm, 
He got his own, he went back to school. He became, he's a practicing veterinarian right now. This guy used to throw up every morning going to work. He hated his job so bad. And it's like out of that dream, Carl Jung calls these big dreams. See, see and what's happening when you dream? What's happening is that socio-cultural consciousness is dropping off and you're going into that larger reservoir of consciousness. You're touching your wonder child in your dreams. And, and you see, it's wonderful. We dream four years of our life, and we dream uh, quite a bit every night. Whether you remember it or not, we know that people dream. And your dreams are like unopened letters to you. But you see, if you're a shame-based, adult, child, codependent man, come on. I ain't got time for any of this. I'm too busy defending my life. But, but one, so one of the things that I'm suggesting is that part of spiritual work is dream work, beginning to discover. This is what I call the discovery stage. This is empowerment. This is finding out who you really are. Or, or looking at your fascinations. Looking at your fascinations. You know, uh, it's like... Um, what are some fascinations in your life? Let me give you two examples. I, I, I go to bookstores and I buy tremendous numbers of books that I never read. Okay, I don't know that anybody can identify with this. But I, but, but I come home with books, you know, I've got all these books, and, and then I put them all up. And, uh, and on two occasions, and this is years ago, I, bu I bought a book. I bought a book that just fascinated me. I didn't know anything about family systems. The book was called The Family Crucible by uh, Whitaker and Napier. A lot of you know this book. It's a very famous book, but I didn't know the book. It just, something about the book jumped out of me. It fascinated me. And then, uh, then on another occasion, I bought another book, a little red book that said shame on the back of it. And it was by an anonymous writer from Hazleton. Uh, when I was thinking about a subject for the family program, somebody had come to me, a woman named uh, Liz Catterley came to me at Channel 8 in Houston and said, let's do a series. I want to do a series with you. I said, well, okay, well, you know, what will I do it on? And, uh, and she said, well, anything you want to do it on. And, and it was this book that I went to one day and started reading, and I couldn't put the book down. I had known some things about family systems, but I hadn't, hadn't really gotten connected with it. From that book, I read uh, Sharon Westheider Cruz's book, where, where it talked about the family and the alcoholic family with the alcoholic, the chief enabler, the lost child, the hero, and the scapegoat. And I said, oh my God, there's my family. And it was out of that that I did the family series. Then later on, when I was writing the book on shame, I, I was stuck. I, 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 I had read what was available, Gershon Kaufman's book. I had read the book called Facing Shame by Fossum and Mason. Uh, but, but there was something about, and I didn't even know this at the time. I didn't know that we only had one word in English for shame and that other languages had two words. But, but it was about healthy shame and, and, and that there was another kind of shame, that, that there was a healthy shame and there was a toxic shame. Well, I, I, I went to this little red book. And in this book, that book was a great inspiration for me. Because in that book, that was the book where they talked about the more than human, less than human. These two polarities, uh, that shame was the permission to be human. Later on, I found out that Max Scheler had said uh, that shame is something that's specifically human. Gods don't have shame and animals don't have shame, only us. And, and, and cross-cultural studies, shame is a naturally occurring emotion. But here were two books that I had been fascinated by. I don't know why I bought those books. Now, you know, you could say, oh, man, that's just a coincidence. Maybe it is. But what I'm suggesting to you tonight is to start looking at that kind of stuff, of people that you're fascinated by, people who you're fascinated by that you don't like. That, that's really interesting. Uh, uh, you, you might really want to take a look at that one. Uh, for example, I did a workshop one time with David Garden, who's a wonderful NLP neuro-linguistic programming teacher. 
And David said, you know, get in a group. He had us all get in a group. And he said, now, don't go get with somebody that you like or know. You know, it's like, what? You know, because what happens? If somebody says, you know, farm a little group, you're going to get with somebody that's familiar to you, right? Well, that's just the person you'll learn nothing from, right? Because that's the one you're most like. He said, get with somebody that just turns you off. And like three women came over to me, which was, uh, which was not a happy moment, uh, actually. But, but, <laughs> but the whole point of it was, the whole point of it was that you see, sometimes when you're fascinated by somebody, and, and it may be a negative kind of thing, it's something to really take a look at. It may be something, there's something you need to learn there. There's something you need to know about. There's something about that person that may be triggering you. It also may be a waste of time, too. And some fascinations watch out for, because if you're a shame-based adult child and you still have a wounded child, you're probably, you're boom, 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 you know, right over to the person that's just the person that, you know, is going to be very destructive to you, or you've had patterns of that. We've already talked about that. Uh, intuitions. Einstein said, long before I could ever write it down, I knew it. Long before I could ever conceptualize it, I knew it. Hunches, intuitions. See, see, when you grow up and you can't, all of your experience is invalidated, why would you trust your hunches? Most of you knew what was going on in your family. I do this workshop on family secrets. People know all about their family. They don't know that they know, but they know. They know at an intuitive level. You know, I'll say, what do you guess was going on with your dad? What do you guess was going on with your mom or in their marriage? And boy, people will pop an answer out. It's like they knew at some level. And then synchronicity is this thing where you have this connection. Uh, when I was thinking about the family series, we needed money for that series. I got a phone call one morning from Beth Miller who said, John, I want you to do a TV series. Like, what? You want me to do a TV series? Yeah, yeah, Charlie and I have been talking about it. Charlie and Beth Miller are these wonderful humanitarians. And, 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 and within, within a week, they were funding the series for me, the family series. We all owe Beth and Charlie Miller a lot for that family series because they're the ones that, and that just came out of nowhere, came out of nowhere. I, I was sitting there one morning thinking, you know, how am I going to do this? And, and so that's what I call synchronicity. Those are energetic emergences. Now, I want you to, our Deschardins talks about collecting rocks. Einstein talks about a magnet he had when he was five years old. Trust that there's energy in that child, in that wonder child. And, and no matter what you got out of that, just, just really trust that there is this deeper place inside of you, that you can go in there. You created a room just now, and you can have this room. It can be your special place, a place where no one else can come. Uh, creativity is our birthright. Creativity is what the wonder child is. The wonder child celebrates life. Listen to this poem. I just sort of ran, a, this was a, a, a poem I ran across the other day. It, it's, it's by William Alexander Percy. It's a limited edition of poetry on silence and of stars, it's called. Of silence and of stars. This is the wonder child. I have need of silence and of stars. Too much is said too loudly. I am dazed. The silken sound of world infinity is lost in voices shouting to be heard. I once knew men as earnest and less shrill, and under meaning that I caught I miss among these ears that hear all sounds save silence. These eyes that see so much but not the sky these minds that gain all knowledge but no calm. If suddenly the desperate music ceased, could they return to life? Or would they stand in dancers' attitudes, puzzled, polite, for an encore to fill the ghastly pause? I do not know. Some rhythms there may be I cannot hear, but I, oh, I must go back where the breakers of deep sunlight roll across flat fields that love and touch the sky, back to more of earth and less of man, for there is still a plain simplicity and friendship poor in everything but love. 
and faith unwise, unquestioned, but a star. Soon now the peace of summer will be there with cloudy fire of myrtles in full bloom. And when the marvelous wide evenings come, across the molten river one can see the misty willow green of Arcady, and then the summer stars, I will be home. That's the wonder child. That's the wonder child expressing, expressing that sense of we belong to this earth, all of us belong to this earth, now, I don't want to over-idealize the wonder child. Sam Keen says we become human only by leaving Eden, mature only by realizing that childhood is over. We come home to the fullness of our humanity only in owning and taking responsibility for present awareness, as well as for the full measure of our memories and dreams. Graceful existence integrates past, present, and future. But it's a beautiful... Uh, idea that, that my adult can have this wonder child as a resource that I can use my adult experience and I can have this rich creativity. That's our birthright. T.S. Eliot said, do I dare disturb the universe? And James Joyce said at the end, the portrait of an artist, welcome, O life. I go forth for the millionth time to encounter the reality of experience and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race, that every single one of us are called to be a creative act. There was a time, Wordsworth says, when meadow, stream, and every common sight did seem to me apparelled in celestial light, but those things I used to see, I see no more. That's the old aging Wordsworth. The vision and the dream. See, see what I'm saying is that you can see them again by embracing this wonder child, by being willing to embrace the pain of reclaiming the inner child, by, by loving and nurturing and championing that child, we can touch this wonder child again. This wonder child, Hopkins, you know, Gerard Manley Hopkins, glory be to God for dapple things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stifle upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnut falls, Finch's wings, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how? Who knows how to make a freckle? Finch's wings, those rose moles all in stifle on trout that swim. That's the wonder child. Look at the dolphin boss, Zorba. And when Zorba's big project collapses, he dances. He starts dancing. See, see this is the wonder child that loves and embraces life, this Zen moment, that, that gal in Thornton Wilder's Our Time that goes back to live her 12th birthday and she comes to the center of the stage because nobody has any time for her. She says, oh, Earth, you're just too good to anybody to realize. Doesn't anybody live life while they've got it? And that's the question for you to think about.